Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show connecting coaching, baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. Thank you for joining us today. First new episode of 2023, episode 65. Unfortunately, Cassie is not here for those who don't know. And if you do, I hope you sent out your congratulations to her. But for those who don't know, she did just recently give birth and she is on maternity leave. She will be back with us, though, in the next couple of weeks. But I've got good news. I'm not doing this alone. I couldn't do this show alone. Some of you are probably saying, thank goodness for that, right? Uh, let me bring in my new co my new friend and our co-host, my co-host this week for episode 65, Brett Paneros, who is the doctor of chiropract chiropractic and rehabilitation. He runs his own company, and I'm glad that we were able to join us today, Brett. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about athletes dealing with pain. We're going to talk about returning to a sport after you had such pain. We're going to talk about the mental side. We're going to talk about some of the things that are out there right now, misinformation when it comes to chiropractic and rehabilitation that athletes have to ignore because some of this information, it's right at their fingertips and some of it is really, really bad. We're going to talk about all that today. But Brett, thank you for joining us here on Cross Functionality. I really appreciate you. I uh, really appreciate you having me in, and especially being the first episode of twenty twenty four. Let's uh, let's try and kick this year off with a, with a little bit of a bang. Hopefully, I can provide a lot of information out there to all the parents and athletes, and answer some questions about injury, specifically relating to the baseball and softball player as well. Well, Brett, I don't know if you're a big Seinfeld fan or just a Larry David fan in general, but I'm not saying this episode is coming out. What is today? Today is the sixth when we record this. This episode will be out. I think, what, on the 11th, I'm going to estimate Wednesday the 11th, we are way past the time, as Larry David has said, of saying Happy New Year. So <laughs> I'm not going to say Happy New Year to anybody um, for the rest of the year because we have passed that point. It's the past January 2nd. There is no more Happy New Year. But thank you for joining us in the first episode again of 2023 for Cross Functionality. All right, so athletes dealing with pain. Let's get right into this thing here because there's a lot of uh, questions that I have for you that we have that pertain to athletics and to rehabilitation injuries, but athletes dealing with pain and coming back from that pain. And I, I think that you don't have to necessarily be an athlete to be experiencing pain. As you get older, pain in your joints, pain in your muscles. If you go work out, do any type of fitness, you are going to have some pain in your joints. How do you deal with that pain? and still try and progress and to do physical activities that help your overall quality of life? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. And I think anybody that's played a sport, either recreationally at a more serious level, eventually you know that injury and pain is just part of athletics, right? It, they go hand in hand. We do as much as we can to help prevent that um, through rest, through strengthening, through appropriate intervals of cross training, whether it be playing a different sport or just making sure that you have some sort of an off season um, but I always tell athletes, and the reason we see so many injuries at the professional level is the more force you produce, the more power you produce, the more likely you are to get hurt. Um, it's why we see so many ligament tears and UCL tears in the MLB. It's why we still see so many shoulder injuries in college softball. It doesn't, just because you're a great athlete, it does not excuse you from having and dealing with injuries or pain. It's just part of the game. Now, the question of yeah. how do we go about dealing with that? is obviously multifaceted and we can get into so many different prongs there. But I think the first thing, first and foremost, is to understand your body. I always tell that to people. Understand the difference between soreness, between what you're dealing with. Is this something I need to get addressed? Is this something I can take a few days off? Um, and we, I think you know, we can go through a few of the maybe red flags that I see that I tell people to be aware of when you're dealing with pain and when you know that this is something that maybe will pass or if it's something that you have to get addressed by a professional. Yeah. And what are some of those red flags? Because I think that a lot of people experience this pain and they sort of just, I'm guilty of this too. They just, oh, as am I. <laughs> I mean, right. You just kind of ignore it and you just keep going and you think it's magically going to go away. And you don't understand that that is a huge red flag for problems that could occur down the line. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the biggest ones, um, and it might be a little bit more obvious, is like the mechanism of onset, you know, and in lay person speak, it's how did this happen? When did this pain begin? If you can pinpoint the pain to a very specific incident, a specific throw, a specific swing, a sprint, a step that you took, and you felt an immediate burst of pain, more often than not, that's what we would refer to almost as like an acute injury, right? More, more of the muscle, uh, the muscle 
strains that we see, the ligament sprains, ligament tears um, for the for the athlete shoulder, the throwing athlete shoulder, labral tears, things along those lines. The more serious ones happen in one particular incident. Now, so if you can trace that back to, yes, I threw this ball and I felt either a pinch, a pop, that's never, I want to say, a great sign going forward. And that's usually something that you want to have addressed because more often than not, if you have that one incident and pain persists, there's probably going to be some treatment along the lines. You're probably going to want to get an image. That Those are indications for me when I'm taking history for somebody that I really want to do a little bit further digging. Now, contrary to that, if take low back pain, for example. Um, you know, if you have a little bout of low back pain, you can't really pinpoint when it happened. Maybe you woke up with it. It gets a little bit better one day, a little worse another day. That's something that, you know, I'm I'm a little bit more um, okay with people waiting out, trying some, trying some simple things like stretching, heating, doing some different movements and just waiting and seeing, maybe laying off, maybe cutting your swings down by 50% while you're dealing with the back pain. But all in all, you know, I'm looking at a few things and that's how did the injury happen? Was it sudden? Was it acute? How severe was the pain? And essentially, is it getting better over the course of the next few days or weeks? Or is it continuing to progress or even getting worse as you continue to do the activity that you're doing, whether it be swinging, hitting, running, whatever that might be? Now, how often do you hear from athletes or just people in general about a nagging pain that doesn't maybe necessarily get worse, but it doesn't really get any better either? How do you treat such? If, even if you're just someone at home, right, and you're yeah. just someone who's trying to feel a little bit better and trying to eliminate some of that muscle pain, how do you treat that? No, absolutely. And that's, this is where um, things tend to get a little bit, bit, bit divergent in terms of examination. So I always tell people there's a few specific reasons why people get pain. One is an inappropriate amount of dosing, whether that be an exercise or a skill. So talk about throwing, right? You can have an inappropriate amount of dosing of throwing. That leads to arm pain, arm injury. Um, the other thing would be mechanical issues. And obviously those can be intertwined and you can have both of those things. And mechanical issues, meaning, you know, you have, maybe you have um, inefficiency in your throwing mechanics that are leading to elbow pain. That becomes a little more complicated because now the pain might be in your elbow, but the real root cause or issue might not be at your elbow. So in terms of treatment, it's just really important, I think, to understand that when you're an athlete, you're using patterns across your entire body. So if you have knee pain, you know, trying to think of, okay, well, I have pain in my knee, um, but do I feel some tightness in my hip? Like, is it is it worthwhile for me to try and do some stretching for my hip, for my ankle, for things along those lines? So I think the best thing that I equip athletes with is education, helping them understand the patterns that they're using when they're doing these sports. That way they can almost go through a little mental checklist and try to self-identify some of the things that they're feeling and how to go from there. Um, one of the easiest things I tell people to do is just to try something different. And what I mean by that is if your routine includes, you know, you do a 15 minute warm up and then you take your swings um, and the warm up usually consists of static stretching. Try doing a little bit more of a dynamic warm up. Mix things up a little bit. Um, just change your routine and see if that has an effect on your pain level. Now, we can also talk about modalities and ice and heat. And I'm, I'm a fan of both of those things if they help you. But the goal is always to address the root cause of what's going on, not to just sort of mask the symptoms, so to speak. Um, and I always tell people, you know, you wait. I'm fine with people giving a little trial of a few weeks of trying something different before it's really time to reach out to somebody that can give you a little bit more guidance. Yeah. So you're not exactly a fan of going on Amazon and looking for ice packs. You might be wasting some of your money doing that. Yeah. And I, look, I, I honestly think that if it's going to give you some relief, you know, I think we can talk about the the icing, you know, where icing has has come and gone in terms of it basically being mandatory to now a lot of people not recommending it because they think it might slow the healing process hmm. um, from acute injury and even after something like throwing. But I think the biggest thing is whatever makes you feel good, because that'll add a little bit of a mental benefit. But if you're having persisting pain for weeks or months and you're icing after after a game or after a practice just to make the pain go away, only to have it resurface when you start the next practice, then there's definitely better use of your money and time than just trying to find things to to mask that discomfort. So what would you recommend for people who do have, because again, you know, these these type of injuries and just kind of nagging, we're not talking about big time injuries here, right. we're talking about nagging muscle injuries. 
that I think that everybody listening, anybody, quite frankly, who might stumble upon this episode can relate to. What, what would be your recommendation from a mobile, mo- mobility standpoint yeah. that would help people recover quicker and eliminate some of that muscle soreness? I think having a really good arm care and mobility routine and strength routine, honestly, to tell you the truth, is is a really good answer for that. Most of what I end up doing with people that come in with these nagging pains is identifying what I would call movement inefficiencies. Essentially, my job, which uh, I find funny and know, you know, people tend to tend to kind of scoff at this too. It's like my job is not to point out your strengths. I mean, I'll tell people their strengths. But if we just work on your strengths all the time, then, you know, we're not going to really elevate your game or your resiliency as an athlete. My job is to say, hey, you do this really well, but I think we can work on this. I think we can work on your ability to stabilize your shoulder overhead. So what I tell people to do is build a strength routine or a mobility routine that um, that includes a whole host of movements that are very different in nature. Uh, while I'm, I am a fan of like band warmups because they, you know, they fire up the rotator cuff, they get blood flowing. What I think are more important in a warm up are movements like push ups, um, downward dog. If you're, you know, if you're familiar with the yoga movement, there lunges with twists, things that put your body in different rotational planes that allow you to stabilize, that really sort of prime the system for the movement that you're about to do, instead of just isolating and warming up the pieces of it as we go through. Right. So you're hitting multiple facets of what you might be doing movement wise by some of the things you just suggested there. I'm surprised you didn't mention uh, push up pluses. That's a new popular one that Yeah, I actually so that we years what, is gain traction. I call uh, like there we what we call a yoga push up is the combination sure. of a push up into a downward dog. Um that's one of my favorite ones because it gets the whole shoulder blade moving. Um you know, it helps you stabilize through and then sh- things like shoulder taps and there's you know, there's thousands of exercises that you can design in terms of just creating a well-rounded program like bear crawling before game. Yeah, I have a lot of my athletes that are dealing with shoulder or elbow pain. They'll actually get into like a bear crawl position and go for 10 yard bear crawls, not to the point of fatigue, but just the point of really feeling like you primed your system and you warmed up. And I always tell people there are a few crucial elements of a warm up. Um, the first should be to just elevate your body temperature get yourself breathing a little heavy sweating. You'll actually elevate the temperature of your muscles, which will make them a little bit more pliable. Um, and then the next important one should be you want to warm up the muscle groups that you're going to use. That's where like the band work comes in. But then more than anything is you want to warm up the patterns you're going to use at the intensity you're going to use them, right? And it's simply put, if I said to any baseball or softball player or parent, um, your whole warm up routine for throwing, you're never going to throw more than 50% intensity during your warm up routine. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make much sense, right? Because if I have to get in the game and throw 100%, don't I want to throw 100% in warm ups? Absolutely, you do. Most athletes, especially middle school, high school, some college, because they can get away with maybe not warming up as much. And you and I know very well that we can't really get away with that anymore. <laughs> but I see more than anything that a well-designed warm-up routine that's high intent can prevent most injuries that happen on a field, especially muscle strains and ligament sprains. What are your thoughts, talking about warm-ups here, what are your thoughts on do when, when people do ex- certain exercises, certain compound movements, like say a bench press, like a squat, what are your thoughts on doing those last in the workout program, doing the supplemental exercises first, really firing and warming up those joints and saving the bench press and the squat for last? In other words, are doing those two things last in your workout program, does that prevent or at least help prevent certain injuries that might occur if you were to do those two exercises first? So it's a great question. And I think I I do talk exercise prescription with people. So besides being a chiropractor and in the sports rehab field, my background is in strength and conditioning Mm -hmm. um, as well. So I I try and blend the two of those. And in my opinion, rehab is really just strength and conditioning, but it's masked based on what you're dealing with at a given time and very focal, I'd say more so. But my goal is always to return people to a more of a performance look. And a lot of people that have worked with me will say like, by the tail end of your treatment plan, it basically looks like a strength and conditioning session. Um, it's just very tailored, I think, around what you're dealing with. I think my thoughts on that are you typically want to structure the exercises that are including like the highest output of energy early on and the ones that I think have the highest risk for not necessarily injury, but the highest risk for, for going wrong. So I like to structure that. First, like power movements, if you're doing something like sprinting or jumping, 
that's usually structured in the beginning of the workout, um, followed by any heavier compound movements. But with the preface that if we're structuring the workout, I, I, I include the warm up in the actual workout itself, right? So to go on your point, what I think you were getting at was I make sure that an athlete is thoroughly warm, that they've prepped the movement. Now, so if we're doing a deadlift, for example, um, I might have them do different versions of a hinge, like body weight, single leg RDLs or single leg hinges to prep that movement pattern, warm up that muscle group, and then gradually load a barbell for a deadlift. So I, I think it's never a good idea to just use the movement as a warm up necessarily, unless you want to be there for quite a long time. So like if you're going to get up and deadlift 200 pounds in your working set, just to go into the gym cold load a bar with a hundred pounds and 150 than 200. I think it's, there's definitely a better way to go about it than that. But I also don't like saving the compound movements till the end because you do want the majority of your energy put forth into those movements because they do require more of your energy. Right. Well, and also too, I think that people, something people miss out on and, and you mentioned it there, very astute point about the power move, the power exercise. And, and I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but that could be anywhere, anything from a box jump to a jump rope into a plank or a plank type series and warm up the core, but also you're getting that power move in with the jump rope as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I often tell people there are very few sports that really require you to exert force onto somebody else, mm -hmm. football being one of them, rugby, right? Like in certain contact sports, hockey and, and whatnot, um, football is a great example as, why, as to why weightlifting might be really important because you're not only trying to manipulate your body weight, you're trying to manipulate the body weight of someone in front of you. But the interesting thing about baseball, softball is that it's really just you're, you're trying to manipulate your body weight in space and against the ground. So while doing strength movements really helps with force production and putting force into the ground, which is definitely important, um, power i think becomes really the most important part of a sport like baseball and softball and that's moving load under speed and in this case it's just moving your body weight so i think any program that neglects things like jumping sprinting and like you had said it can be as mild as a jump rope over repetitive time or you could do a max effort box jump or a max effort broad jump that's very important because as we know i mean the swing is about speed arm speed matters a ton in terms of throwing velocity so we want to make sure that we ha we're having our athletes move fast, not only in training, but when they get before they get back onto the field as well. What I end up seeing is too many of these rehab programs. If an athlete has injured their shoulder, for an example, you know, you'll do a lot of band work, you'll do a lot of isolation exercise, but there's a gap missing from the end of rehab, physical therapy, whatever you want to call it, to them returning to the field. There has to be a gap. They should be challenging themselves in rehab just as much as they would on the field or else how are you going to know that they're ready to return that's where we see people that relapse on their pain and have issues coming back and returning to sport so when you talk about returning to sports after pain after an injury what are some obstacles that athletes you kind of alluded to it right there but what are some mm -hmm. obstacles that uh, athletes encounter when they're trying to get back to their sport get back to 100 percent, and get back not just into game shape, but get get back into being able to compete at the highest level. So I'll start at different levels because um, I do I treat different levels of injury, right? I have a few post op cases um, that I work on from you know the nature of my practice is that I'll have a, I'll have a handful of cases at a time. Some of them are post op, for instance. One thing that I see that middle school and high school athletes and college athletes really suffer with, um, and even professional athletes, honestly, is the mental side of things when you wrap your identity up. And being somebody that is an athlete that works really hard where you know when people to say oh describe yourself i'm a baseball player i'm a softball player and now all of a sudden that's taken away from you because you know you have eight months of recovery after a surgery that becomes really hard so the first conversation i have with people if it's going to be a serious injury that they're out for a long period of time is a conversation about what the road ahead might look like is the mentality that they need to have you're still an athlete instead of dedicating yourself to training now you're dedicating yourself to getting better. Um, put that same mindset that you had into training and being on the field as to being in here, being in the recovery room, taking your nutrition and your sleep very seriously. So that's the mental side of things. Now, the physical side of things is, is very important too, because if you're on a high school team, if you're on a travel team, you might practice five, six days a week. You're playing a few games a week, double headers on the weekends. Most of the time, at most, I'll see somebody two, three times a week. So there are 
are and and for an hour at a time maybe a typical practice only you know will go more than an hour two hours two and a half hours and games and double headers obviously forget about it so what i run into and the athlete runs into is if you're just seeing me two times a week for an hour at a time and you're stressing yourself then and all of a sudden we think you're going to go back to practicing six days a week full intensity you know there ha there's going to be a little bit of a disconnect there so part of the issue that people go back in is the workload issue where they're not getting challenged enough in rehab where yes, the body has healed. The actual injury is not, you know, it's not inflamed anymore. There's no tear. The surgical site has healed, but that doesn't mean that you're ready to go back. If you think about an ACL tear, it's not like you tear your ACL, you get the surgery, you sit on your couch, the surgical grafts heal, heals, and now all of a sudden you can go back and run and cut again. So you need to be stressed. Your body has to adapt. And I think sometimes people just are not stressed enough to the point where they're confident to go back and their body can hold up to the stress that they're putting it through when they return back to sport. Yeah, I'd love to hear your opinion about this, but everybody made a, a big scuttlebutt, if you will, right last fall about, uh, I almost said Brett Favre, about Aaron Rodgers returning or possibly returning this season to the New York Jets because they saw video footage of him on the field prior to the game. He was throwing, really wasn't putting much pressure on that Achilles which I'm sure probably, by the way, and we can get into this uh, another point of today's episode, the Achilles injury is probably one of the worst that you see and one of the worst oh, you have to rehab athletes. Absolutely. But, um, when you, going back to Aaron Rodgers, though, people, you mentioned something in there that, that I think a lot of people didn't realize is that, yes, he was doing that stuff on the field and his recovery was uh, pretty quick, I would think, from that Achilles injury, but he wasn't putting the necessary amount of stress on that injury and stress on his body to be able to compete at the highest level of the National Football League. And that's one of the components that I think people were missing out on, that he was not putting that necessary stress that he needed to on that Achilles. And sometimes I think maybe athletes, and obviously you know better than me, but may, but athletes don't understand that part of it too. They just want to get back on the field. Okay, I did my rehab, check the box. Now it's time to get back on the field, but they haven't really test that injury, whatever that may be, yep. and they haven't put enough stress on that injury to tell them, okay, now we're ready to compete again. Yeah. And, you know, just because of our audience and I know who our audience is, and I, I, I want to provide as many useful tips as I can. So when you're seeking a rehab professional or a surgeon, um, but specifically a rehab professional, because a lot of these surgeries, they're done very similarly, right? Like you have obviously surgeons that are at the top of their game that specialize in certain things, but What's really going to make or break your recovery is what type of rehab and really how seriously you take your rehab. When you're selecting a PT, chiropractor, a strength coach, you want to ask a lot of questions. Don't assume that we're all the same because we're not. We have different backgrounds. We put, you know, we put different amounts of effort in. We have different facilities. We have different approaches. So make sure that you ask the right questions. And some of the questions that you can ask are, one, do have you ever rehabbed this injury before? How many? What is your success rate? rehabbing this injury? What's your approach? Um, and what measures do you use to progress and clear for return to sport? Uh, I'm, I try as best I can to always have objective measures as we, as we go, as I go through this, you know, I use force play data. Um, I'm lucky enough to be in a facility and it's obviously uh, coach Cassie's facility. So, um, you know, we have, I have a lot at my disposal, but I don't subscribe to the timeline based return to sport model. I subscribe to the prove to me that your body can handle the forces that it needs to handle model. And as best I can, it's not perfect, but trying to have objective data to make sure that you come back. So if you're, if you're an athlete who has even just a rotator cuff, just a strain of the rotator cuff, no surgery, but maybe you're out for four to six weeks, demonstrate to me that that shoulder is as strong as it was, or is as strong as the other one, at least, because that's what I have to go off of. So I use tools to measure the strength of rotator cuff and endurance of the rotator cuff. If you have no pain and you can prove to me that you're that strong, then I have no problem clearing you to go back to sport. But just because four to six weeks passed doesn't mean that your body is ready to go back. Um, and then specifically what, what you were alluding to, I'm a suffering Jets fan. So <laughs> that's the... <laughs> That's My dad's a suffering Giants fan, so there is some suffering there too. I know. I'm at least happy that I have some company in New York State now because for the <laughs> longest time, was, I was feeling a little lonesome here in the uh, yeah. in the football department. But um, And this, it's actually a great lesson because I've dealt with a few Achilles injuries um, and clients that, that have come through. Never compare yourself to somebody else you know that had the injury. Even if it's your best friend, they're the same age, they're on your same team. Bodies 
recover differently. Bodies handle force differently. They handle stress differently. And so you have to take your path to recovery. Um, I think so many times we see even, and honestly, uh, the parents listening will know this if they're a football fan, maybe not some of the kids, but Adrian Peterson yeah. tore his ACL and was back in like five months, six months, never had a re-injury. He came back and had the best season of his career, I think. It was in yardage in terms of carried yardage. It's not typical. It's possible. We also have to remember what these athletes are probably getting in terms of care, two sessions a day, all those things taken into consideration. Um, but the overall lesson- In genes too, and I don't mean to cut you off there, but also it, it comes down to DNA and genes. Absolutely. I've had the pleasure of being around a few professional athletes of different track and field, football, baseball, um, and swimming, gymnastics. When you're around a professional athlete, it's, I mean, it's just different. It's their bodies are built differently like, and you realize it right away. And it, it is, it, it's impressive to be around and you realize, you know, I, I like to use the, um, the alert of like, you're dealing with a Ferrari at that point, yeah. right? In terms of, and, and it's okay. We're not all going to get to that level. There's probably people of various levels. You know, I played division three baseball and was very happy with where I got to and had what I deem a successful career, but we just have to realize that we're all different. So comparing yourself to another person in the recovery it's just never a good idea because it sets you up for failure um, right off the bat. You know, you mentioned back injuries earlier, lower back. A lot of people mm -hmm. have that problem, a sciatica problem uh, that goes all the way down from their hamstring to their bottom of their foot, right? And I always like to roll the tennis ball underneath my foot to keep that um, that muscle loose. But that's one of the injuries that people deal with a lot, just normal mm -hmm. everyday life. But a lot of people deal with shoulder mobility type injuries and they deal yeah. with whether it be front shoulder or the side of the shoulder, I'm sure I'm not using the right terminology. I know I'm not, but nonetheless, I think people know what I'm talking about. A lot of times the shoulder mobility, it's a good test when they lift something overhead and they can't really do it without any sort of pain. I've been there before. Fortunately, I've gotten out of it. But I do wonder, extra when it comes to, we, and we talked earlier about exercise order. When it yep. comes to exercise order, when you're working on your shoulders, for example, do you recommend doing, say, a landmine, I'm just spitballing here, a yep. landmine split jerk, landmine push press, and then a dumbbell or barbell, I prefer dumbbell, dumbbell shoulder press, or should it be reversed, vice versa? Because shoulder injuries, that's another thing that I think plagues a lot of, for lack of a better term, washed up athletes as much as it does <laughs> active athletes. Yeah, I, I mean, the shoulder is... Actually, it's actually one of my favorite things to work with because of the complicated nature of the joint. Most people think of the shoulder as like we think, oh, it's the ball and the socket. And that is the glenohumeral joint, right? That's a component of the shoulder. But the shoulder joint, re joint relies on so many moving pieces. It relies on your scapula, aka your shoulder blade, which makes up the socket. That kind of dictates where the joint goes in space. And then we have to remember that the shoulder blade lies on top of your rib cage, which is connected to your mid back or your, your thoracic spine. Um, and so I, I use the, the sort of comparison to a train being on the track where the pain and like the actual shoulder joint where you have your pain is like the train and you can soup up your train. You, you know, you can make it a bullet train. You can give it new seats. You can, uh, make it electric power instead of coal power. But at the end of the day, if the track that it's running on is messed up and it's broken, that thing is useless, you know? So I use every joint around the shoulder as a little bit of a sort of a barometer of how the shoulder's doing. And you fix the track before you fix the train. Because at the end of the day, like I said, you can have the greatest train in the world. If the track isn't fixed, it's not going anywhere. Now, in terms of what you had said, um, landmine press versus shoulder press with the dumbbell, I think a lot of it, again, depends on the intensity of what you're doing. If you're making the landmine press the more intense movement, because it tends to be a little safer, maybe a safer range of motion. I would actually typically do that one first because you you want to have the pro uh, as much energy in terms of controlling that movement if you're putting most of your force and energy toward that during the training day. If you're making the dumbbell press, the overhead press, the prime movement of the day, and the landmine press will be a little bit more of an accessory movement, a little lighter in weight, more for technique, then I actually prefer people do that heavier movement first again, with the caveat that you had already gotten yourself overhead, you've done some movements that primed you to get that dumbbell or that landmine press overhead. And now you're going to hear varying opinions on this, honestly, like I, I'm not claiming to be this, that's simply my opinion, because I would rather someone go into the heaviest movement that they're going to do fresh 
as opposed to somewhat fatigued. Um, but the other thing with that too is there's so many there's so much pressure on people to do specific movements in the weight room. And I want to reiterate to people, if you're a power lifter or an Olympic lifter where your sport is literally how much you can put on that bar and lift, then you have to do a deadlift, you have to do a squat, you have to do a bench press, you have to do a power clean or a snatch, right? Because that is your sport. It's like saying, hey, I want to be uh, the starting shortstop for your team, but like, I don't really want to hit. And I mean, fielding, it's kind of like not my thing, you know, like it just doesn't work that way. The weight room for an athlete is the place where you should get better at your sport. You should prevent injury for your sport. If you're going into the weight room and you are hurting yourself repetitively, if you're so sore or you are you know, deadlifting and your back hurts when you deadlift, so now it's affecting your swing, there's a problem there. And uh, I'm not saying don't deadlift, don't squat, because you can figure out the mechanics and how they work for you. But remember, there's no one movement that you have to do in any given setting. You have to know what works for you. You have to be honest with what works for you. I have athletes that no matter what we do, we can't figure out why. The only thing in the gym that bothers them is a back squat. We look at every mechanic. We narrow it down. And it just doesn't work. So you know what? We switch to a lunge. We switch to a Bulgarian split squat, maybe even a front squat if it changes the load for them. They're still getting a training effect of putting force into the ground. And at the end of the day, we're kind of... But, you know, we're getting the desired effect. So don't don't feel like you have to do a movement just because you see it on social media or your favorite strength coach said you have to do deadlifts. It's going to make your swing better. It's just not the case for everybody. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. All the studying that I've done on on fitness and body um, body control and taking care of the body. Every, everybody says this, everybody's different, right? You mentioned it there. Everybody has a different type of workout program. Prescription of exercises might be different. They may do different type of progressive overload. They may use isometric or eccentric type movements and, and incorporate that into progressive overload, overload. Everybody's different. But the one thing that I've noticed where everybody see all trainers seem to unite on is the simple point of there are different ways. Nothing is set in stone. And you're, right. even if you prescribe a certain exercise, nothing is set in stone. You don't have to do the back squat. You don't have to do a front squat. You don't have to do a certain type of, or say, straight bar deadlift. You can do a trap bar deadlift. Mm -hmm. Nothing is certain. Nothing is set in stone. You can do different types of compound movements, but are, that are still compound movements, maybe just a little bit different from the traditional. Right. Absolutely. And I always go back to explaining to people the why behind everything. I like to yeah. explain the why behind how I treat somebody, like why I'm deciding to do some deep tissue therapy here or why I'm deciding to manipulate this joint, why I'm choosing this exercise. And the why behind strength training is to better prepare yourself for the forces that you're going to encounter during your sport. So at the end of the day, whether we're squatting or deadlifting, we're not really trying to mimic anything in the actual sport. We're trying to get better at putting force into the ground and exerting force upon, you know, so that we can push into the ground better when we swing, so that we can push into the ground better when we sprint. Um, you know, I wouldn't choose the back squat for a basketball player because it mimics the early portion of a jump, you know, like when you get too nitty and gritty like that, that's where we end up with sort of like silly exercises where you're just like trying to add a ton of load and weight to the, to a skill movement that someone does in their, in their actual sport. You have to take a sort of like a bird's eye view of why we're doing something. And it's the weight room is really about creating force and creating resiliency in the body, strengthening the ligaments, strengthening the tendon, strengthening the muscle so that you create a more resilient and powerful athlete, not so that you create a better squatter. You know, like I said, that only matters in powerlifting. Really, it really does. You, you're trying to create a better softball player. And how does that happen? Movement diversification load management, appropriate loading, appropriate rest, and then proper allocation to skill development as well. You know, um, you can tell that we're, you know, you're, I can tell you're very passionate about strength and conditioning along with, of course, uh, rehabilitation and playing as you did at a high level. Um, when it comes to baseball, playing at a, at a high level, collegiate level, you, you probably, you understand, you probably heard this before, even before you were a professional that um, landmine squ um, landmine presses, excuse me, are mm -hmm. better for the shoulder, better for shoulder health, especially for pitchers mm -hmm. than say a barbell bench press. Is mm -hmm. that true or false? Uh, it's so hard to put definites on them. I'd say for the yeah. average, for the average, I'd say it's true. And for these reasons, mm -hmm. the landmine press tends to be a little bit, I've just seen people 
it'd be a little safer for the general for like if we look at all athletes it tends to be a little safer because you're operating in more open space the problem with a bench press for me is that when you lay on a bench you're creating a little bit more you're creating a closed chain movement meaning you are rooted to the bench it's harder for your shoulder blade to move around your rib cage in fact if you look at a power lifter the best power and, and any power lifter will tell you you really don't want that much movement of the shoulder blade. You tack that shoulder blade down to create stability in the shoulder. A landmine press, whether you're kneeling or standing, you're actually doing the opposite. You want your shoulder blade to move and rotate upward. Now, like the facility, Velo U SSA, that you know that I'm located in, that Coach Cassie is a is a co-owner of. Um, they do both. They're, they'll have some of their athletes, even pitchers, bench press, but it's it's selective. It's it's are they able to do the desired movement with low risk. And a lot of times it's just, it's risk assessment. But overall, if I was to put a true false statement on that, again, with a cab, with like, you know, numerous caveats, but I would say true. I would say a landmine press is probably one of the best exercises that a thrower can do because it's developing overhead strength and stability, but it's also allowing the shoulder blade and all the joints around the shoulder to move and rotate as opposed to being tacked down with something like a bench press um, or a, a dumbbell press even. Yeah. Um, before we wrap things up, this, this question has to be asked to you. I think this is very important as someone who is again, doctor of chiropractic and rehabilitation. Brett, I appreciate you doing today's episode, episode 65 of cross functionality. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube, watch the show softball strength Academy, YouTube page and follow us on social media. I'm at Jim Tara. Brett is at Apollo. P-C-N-Y. I got that correct, right? At yeah, Apollo, yeah, P-C-N-Y, all one word. So go ahead and, and give Brett a follow on all social media platforms. But an email is too, jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com. People are watching the show. It's right there at the bottom of your screen. But it, for people out there on, speaking of social media, on in, there's things on Instagram, right? And there's a couple of accounts that I follow on, on Instagram and Twitter that are very informal and um i get a lot of good tips from the things that they say the information that they may disperse out but there's a lot of things out there on tiktok right now for example and I've, i think i've talked about with this with cassie before off air uh back in the fall i saw on tiktok this trend actually made its way to twitter how people now young people to get better jaw lines they're actually taking you're gonna love this too by the way <laughs> they're taking hammers to their face oh, and to their it. cheekbones and they're actually breaking their face and thinking that when the face is it contorts back to and, and the bones can connect back together that you'll have a better jawline you're shaking your head and yes i i was too and i i was a big proponent of putting those people who are giving that information out there in jail that's where they belong but there's a lot of skincare um for example another a lot of skincare tips on on ins on uh, twitter and on tiktok and there's a lot of gardening tips out there. I saw that last week on TikTok. Anyway, I'm sure, point being, I'm sure there's a lot of tips out there for athletes on TikTok about rehabilitation, getting quit, getting better, and some of it is misinformation. How does an athlete decipher through the proper information on social media, because it is everywhere, um, pick the right information and apply that, if needed, um, to their injuries? Uh, it's such a good question, because we live in such an amazing time now where... Yeah. You can learn a new skill just from YouTube. You can get amazing information like the one that your podcast um, provides people for no cost and, you know, just, just the cost of their time. Um, and there is so much and chiropractic has, is, is a, I think a particular field where there, there are accounts just set up to watch and hear people manipulate joints, right? They just put a microphone on the back and just all you hear is crunch all over the place, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I always just tell people if it passes the sniff test, like that's the first thing, right? Like you have to just look at these things objectively and say like, is this something that seems what a rational person <laughs> might do? Um, then you kind of like create a little funnel system, right? But at the end of the day, I always tell people, I want to be a resource for people as well. Um, people that may never step in my office. So people that reach out on Instagram, I do my very best to get back to them. I would just say, create a network of people that you trust. Because as you sift through this information, if you're not a professional in the field, it's really, really hard for you to, to, you know, to be able to validate some of this information, right? For instance, like I might see financial tips on 
TikTok or Instagram. That's another I'm not a financial point. professional, right? I have no idea whether or not these things are actually true, whether it's worthwhile to look into. So what do I do? I try and I try and connect and surround myself with people that are in that field that can give me honest opinions. The bad thing about social media right now is just like you said, you can find information that is not only is not only false, but it's dangerous, it's harmful, but you can find just as many accounts that are really genuinely trying to help you. Um, my recommendation for athletes and parents would be reach out. The worst thing that happens is that the person either says, no, I don't want to connect or I can't connect or you don't hear back from them, but eventually you will, you will reach somebody that's willing to just have a quick conversation. Even if that's, Hey Brett, I, uh, I saw this, you know, online that if I, you know, if I throw chicken bones on the table and then I, you know, do a rain dance that like my shoulder pain is going, going to go away. For <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I'll hop on Instagram and you probably get a voice memo from me just being like, hey, Jim, thanks so much for reaching out. You know, like, I'll be honest, I, I, I don't really see how that would help you in this situation, but instead try doing these, things. you know, yeah. so it's not. I'll it, be honest, you sound like an idiot. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for wasting my time. Yeah, <laughs> try this. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> you know, but the thing that I've learned the most, even over you know, having the practice and interacting with so many people is. The things that I think are so simple that people would know because of the specialty and the, the fact that I've spent most of my life studying them, it's not the case. And and I don't expect people to understand or know a thing about strength and conditioning, about rehab, about anatomy, about the body. So I take every question that I get as people genuinely trying to learn. Um, and I think as long as you approach social media with that curiosity, I think you'll, you're you're going to be okay. Um, but my best my best, infer I guess, tip would be surround yourself, even if that is with professionals on social media that you trust and you can run by, run information by, because there is a lot out there and there's a lot of diversity within all of these fields, different ideas, some good, some bad, some harmful. Um, and just, you know, making sure that you have a good network of people that you trust that, that can kind of point you in the right direction. And again, again, the guy to follow is Brett, of course, right? You're the well, guy to follow. Listen, I, like I said, I'll, I'll do the best that I can. You know, I don't claim to be uh, an expert in everything, but I'll try and point you in the right direction. If, if I can't answer your question, that's the best that I can do. But, um, yeah, you know, I really appreciate you having me on and I love being able to provide information to people just because I've been there before. And I know before I studied the field, you know, I had plenty of questions. I suffered plenty of injuries myself. And I think I have the, the retrospective ability to go back and say, if I was in that situation, I, I wish I could have advised myself better or gotten better advisement. So, I seek to provide that for everybody, whether they're in my office or not. Really quick, before we end today's episode, if you have any final parting words or the contact information that you may want to give out to people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I'm constantly checking specifically Instagram. Um, I'm on there a decent amount. And so that uh, at Apollo PCNY, if you reach over, uh, reach out via DM, most likely I'll get back to you within a day or two. Um, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to email me, um, the email is info, I-N-F-O, at ApolloPCNY.com. And same thing, I'd be happy to, you know, get back to you and just provide some some basic information as well. But I think the biggest thing that I, you know, that I want to tell people is your health is extremely important. Um, I understand you dedicate yourself to the sports that you play, but you can't play the sport if if you're hurt. And more times than not, little things that I see that could have been addressed early on are the thing are the things that tend to spiral into bigger things. So um, take the time, listen to your body more than anything, and then surround yourself with people that you trust to help point you in the right direction. All right. Well, Brett, thank you for doing this again. Thank you everybody for listening. Episode 65 back with episode 66 of cross functionality. I can't even say I've been doing 65 episodes. I can't even say the name right back with episode 66 of cross functionality next Wednesday. Thank you for joining us and we will talk to you then.